Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown with me, your decoder, Simon Wams here. We got the Doddleson messages, cryptic computer warnings from the past and the future. That sounds real, because messages from the future are a real thing that definitely happen. Uh, they, they don't. Thank you to Danny who wrote the script. I've never read it before. We're going to learn about it together today. And uh, that sounds like fun, doesn't it? Let's jump in. When the BBC Micro home computer was first rolled out in late 1981, it was marketed as an innovative step into a new dimension. The BBC Micro Model B was designed to be the ultimate home help, a gateway to private education for your kids and your personal electronic accountant, all rolled into one flashy piece of kit for, for just £400. £400 in the 1980s is a lot of pounds today. And I was like, now, I'm sure this was like really impressive at the part in the past, in like 1981, but it's like, ooh, it can do accounting? What to, don't tell me it's got a spreadsheet functions now you could just go to drive.goo.com and it's like boom spreadsheets easy that might seem seem a bit steep nowadays considering that we can cram far more power and functionality into a single free app on our phones than the bbc micro could ever hope to muster the marketing also didn't take into account that all everyone ever really wanted to do on the bbc micro was play chucky egg i i don't know what chucky egg is i i've never heard of the bbc micro this is all happening about six years before i was born but perhaps this expensive machine came packaged with a few hidden features that ventured far beyond the concept of trying to create a spreadsheet for your shopping expenses. In 1984, a story emerged from a cottage situated in the tiny British village of Doddleson in which a borrowed BBC Micro began behaving very strangely indeed, transmitting messages from the past and the future to create a three-way conversation spread across 500 years. <laughs> Someone's getting pranked, right? You've just been pranked, you idiot. They should have mentioned this kind of thing in the advertisements. That's got to be a bit more exciting than an accounting package. Yeah, it's like, can receive messages from the future. Sold. 400 pounds, I'm making that money back real fast. They'll be like, 1981. Wait till the year 2000 rolls around and put all the money in Amazon. <laughs> But did we learn anything useful about the future of mankind during these ghostly communications which were conducted over the course of a few years? And could this have been the result of a haunted home computer, a pesky poltergeist at work in Doddleson, a baffling technical glitch, a human prankster with too much time on their hands, or a quaint cozy cottage crashing into a calamitous crack in the cosmic corridor of chronology? Danny, <laughs> you think that alliteration would challenge me, but I got it out first time. Uh, well, it's not poltergeists. I'd say it's unlikely to be a technical glitch because they're like messages. Like, a technical glitch is like blue screen of death. I think it's a human prankster. Give me a second to boot up the BBC Micro as we attempt to decipher the mystery of the Doddleson messages. Not that many people could afford to splash out £400 on a computer back in 1984, and 29-year-old teacher Ken Webster was no exception. Born in the Lake District in 1955, Ken graduated from Aberystwyth University on the coast of West Wales in 1976 before taking up his first post as an economics teacher. By 1984, Ken and his 19-year-old girlfriends... Oh, it's a hell of an age difference. 19... Oh, no, it's only, well, 10 years. That's quite, that's quite a big age difference, I'd say. What's the rule? Half your age plus seven? So, 29, so 14 and a half plus seven, 21. Oh, Ken, you're breaking the rules. That rule works so well. It's really weird. Ah, today's episode is brought to you by the fantastic people at Magic Spoon. Mmm. Remember when you were a kid watching Saturday morning cartoons, eating a whole lot of cereal? My parents were always like, you know, one bowl, Simon. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I definitely haven't already had five, Dad, sure. Well, look. You're an adult now. I mean, most likely. Maybe you're a kid watching in this, which case that's fine too. Uh, but look, if you're an adult and you want to have cereal, you'll probably be like, oh, it contains way too much sugar. That's not for me. Well, let me introduce you to today's sponsor. I was eating the chocolate chip cookie flavor right now, which is this one right here. And what is fantastic about this is they take all that delicious taste of childhood, like peanut butter, chocolate chip cookie, birthday cake, maple waffle, all these delicious flavors, but they do it in a healthy way. Look, zero grams of total sugars, 5 grams of net carbs, 13 grams of protein, which is nice. I've recently been trying to eat more protein. I've been going to the gym. <laughs> I'm working with a trainer because I'm rubbish at going to the gym. I never do anything. And now I go there and a guy like, just says, do this, do this. I'm like, okay. He's like, eat more protein. I'm like, okay, I got a magic spoon. 
And these are just some of the flavors. They started off with fruited frosted cocoa. Now the, uh, the variety pack you could buy contains peanut butter as well. This is my favorite flavor along with the cinnamon. So what are you waiting for? Click that link below or go to magicspoon.com forward slash unknown and grab yourself a variety pack. Use the promo code unknown. You'll get a sweet $5 off. And guess what? Magic Spoon is so confident in their product that they've got a 100% happiness guarantee. No risk, just deliciousness. Thank you to Magic Spoon for sponsoring and now back to today's video. They decided to move to Doddleson after Ken was offered a teaching job at How H Howarden High School in Flintshire, Wales. Doddleson itself is actually an idyllic village and civil parish on the outskirts of Chester, England. I've got a family in Chester, England. But I didn't. <laughs> Someone asked me to point to Chester, England on a map. I'd be like, don't know. <laughs> but it also sits very close to the North Wales border. And you don't tend to get much trouble brewing in Doddleson, as it boasts a tiny population of just 700 people, most of whom are either retired or still waiting to be found dead. <laughs> dark yeah i used to live in a village with loads of old people it's like there must be so many old people dying here there was like an old folks home the big cemetery where they all go <laughs> that figure was rise to 703 as ken and debbie were moving into a new home with their lodger and good friends nicola baguli who was a budding writer of performance sketches the three newcomers to the village had plenty of work on their hands though ken had bought the keys to meadow cottage a particularly picturesque yet dilapidated 18th century brickstone building in need of tender loving care extensive restoration and maybe a few buckets of paint and a novelty doorbell i'd find it really weird to live with a lodger like i know a mate of mine had this he had a, he had a house and he had like a lodger living in his spare room and they use your kitchen and i find this so weird that's weird i mean i, I get that you know <laughs> Obviously, people sometimes need to do this to have money, but I find this really uncomfortable. I'd be like, I just, I think I'd just rather live in a smaller and less expensive house and not have to live with a stranger. Especially like I'm there with my wife and family and then there's also like, oh, hey, John. <laughs> it's like, what the f but as the trio rolled their sleeves up and got busy, they quickly discovered evidence of another presence lurking in Meadow Cottage, and it wasn't entirely helpful. It certainly wasn't offering to have a go with the paint roller. Ken began to notice six-toed dusty footsteps randomly appearing on the interior cottage walls as if some strange creature had been trying to walk right up them. Not thinking too much of it at first, he just painted over them, but to his annoyance, they kept reappearing in the exact same spot the very next day. Okay, if Ken's not lying, I'd assume that this was like some kid who had like a fun foot stamp or whatever before and put them on the walls and then you paint over it but because you need to do more than one layer of paint they still show through but i think my primary thing is i think ken's probably making this up allegedly in my opinion it wasn't the only weird activity taking place in meadow cottage ken debbie and nicola also reported experiencing sudden gusts of freezing cold wind and the sounds of footsteps upstairs in empty bedrooms debbie recalls that she came home from the shops one day to find all the furniture in the lounge had been stacked into a six foot high pile whilst on another occasion she noted that dozens of tin cans of cat food had been arranged neatly in a pyramid formation on the kitchen floor at first the trio all began to suspect each other of pissing about but when the strange activity continued to occur even after an exasperating Ken pointed out that it was slowing down the renovation of the cottage and it was costing him a bloody fortune in wasted paint, they began to suspect that it was a prank being staged by other residents of the village. That's a pretty severe prank, though. They're breaking into your house to do this for you. Also, it's like an idyllic little village. It's not filled with, like, teenage pranksters. And this would be very elaborate and unnecessary. I think I still think it's either A, one of them, or B, it's being made up, like, later on. Perhaps it was an effort to drive these new folks out of town and their peculiar modern ways. Or it's not entirely inconceivable, there was just some kind of humorous welcoming ritual. After I first moved to a quiet Cornish village in the middle of nowhere, it took me several weeks to realize that despite the friendly advice of the natives, I actually didn't have to leave out a cauliflower and a saucer of gravy for the postman every morning. <laughs> Ah, cauliflower. Exactly what you want as a postman. But events in Meadow Cottage were about to take an even stranger turn, which surely went way beyond a simple practical joke. When the story of the Doddleson messages gets revisited in more recent years, it's usually made out that barely anybody in the world had a computer at home in 1984. I'm not convinced that that's entirely accurate. Yes, it wasn't anything like today, where there's a computer in every home. It's basically a computer in every pocket, isn't there? But plenty of people still had them. My older brother had one, and most of his mates had one, and even some of the rough kids who lived on the other side of town who used to keep pet worms in a matchbox had one. <laughs> He's keeping pet worms in a matchbox, daddy. 
But it's certainly true that not many people had a BBC Micro Model B at home. That was mainly because rival computers such as the Sinclair ZX Spectrum and the Commodore 64 were significantly cheaper and boasted extensive catalogues of thousands of cool games in comparison to the far more serious and expensive BBC Micro, which was largely lacking when it came to the gaming department. Well, yeah, it's for doing serious business like spreadsheets. Produced by Acorn Computers for the BBC Computer Literacy Project in 1981, the BBC Micro Model B was the most boring ass machine that you would pro that you would only usually find in schools getting huddled over by three or four kids all eat abigail pressing a button in fact at one point over 80 percent of schools owned at least one bbc micro yeah i feel like i've seen bbc computers like they had this weird old logo and they're i mean that they look like an old computer but i feel like i've definitely seen bbc computers whether it was a bbc micro i don't know a little bit before my time and that included Haywarden High School, where the teacher Ken Webster was granted an opportunity to borrow one and take it home for a few days. Although it's believed that Ken was something of a computer enthusiast, he wasn't really thinking about himself. The main reason that he brought it home is because he knew that his lodger Nicola was interested in trying out a computer for writing her scripts and sketches. Perhaps when Nicola had finished with it for the night, he could tinker with it himself and knock up her budget spreadsheet to see exactly how much he was forking out for fresh paint every day. The easy Micro Model B came packaged with a whopping 32 kilobytes of memory. <laughs> it's just nothing today. How much is 32 kilobytes? It's like the size of a, a an icon, maybe. A floppy disk drive and a pre-installed word processor, which went by the name of Edward II. <laughs> The past was cheesy. Sadly, there was no Galite gun accessory or USB powered desktop mini vacuum cleaner, but you can't have everything. But on the plus side, this chunky slab of primitive technology did appear to come packaged with a surprised portal into the past! Before we go any further, we should pause to remember why the sudden appearance of a random message on a 1984 computer screen would have felt so puzzling at the time. It's, I mean, it's only got 32 kilobytes of memory, so there's not a lot of space to hide. And second, there's no internet connections. It's not connected to anyone. How is it typing out messages? Obviously, nobody had commercial internet access at home in 1984, and the BBC Micro didn't even come equipped with any kind of modem. So the machine was entirely isolated and incapable of communicating with any network. But it's also worth bearing in mind that it didn't even come equipped with a hard drive. You could open up the Edward II processor and create a new text document, but the only way of saving your work was to copy it to an external floppy disk, otherwise it would all be lost forever as soon as you hit the power off button. <laughs> the past now i can't close things my i was trying to have a phone call last night on facetime and it just wasn't working it just kept disconnecting and like my headphones and stuff so i'm like okay cool i'm just gonna reset my computer so um, i just had too many windows open so i'm, like, I'm just gonna give up and just hold down that power button and it turns off and then i turn it on again and i'm like great fresh start and then i log in and all the bloody windows open again i'm like this is not what i wanted i hard reset you for a reason computer this is why we have problems Oh, I wanted to lose all my unsaved work. Power cuts were so much more intense back in 1984. Why? Oh, because you'd power off the computer and lose all your work. Yeah, that'd be rough. <laughs> I remember at school, we'd just like, we'd be working on the computers and it was like, uh, auto save would only happen every like 20 minutes or something. So you'd have to press control S to save. And so you'd be working on a computer, like tapping away. Bah, 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 and someone would just come past and just reach over and press the reset button on your computer. You'd be like, oh, you john you prick <laughs> or like the race to like pull someone just to go to the computer and do you remember like guys control alt delete you used to bring up task manager but if you hit control alt delete again it would just psh, reset the computer so it just run up to someone's computer and be like ja -da -da -da! press control alt delete twice you'd be like ah oh, you douche what the f man and you'd lose all your work yep the past was fun it's been a really great experience for me so, this is why the sudden appearance of such a random message on a computer which had been left unattended all evening raised a few quizzical qu eyebrows in Meadow Cottage. Why would it? Obviously, the computer's been left alone, and the lodger or one of you two has gone down and typed out a message. Like, that's that's how it works. That's that's what's going on here, if it even happens at all. Ken, Debbie, and Nicola had all popped down to the local pub together to celebrate Christmas whilst hopefully avoiding getting spat on by locals. <laughs> For some reason, either Ken or Nicola had left the BBC Micro switched on in their absence, but it was only displaying the boot screen. Might seem like a bit of a waste of electricity, but that's town folk for you. Upon their return, the trio stumbled back into the cottage to find that the computer screen was now displaying an Edward II document which had been labelled KDN, presumably the first letters of the first names of the intended recipients, and signed with the slightly more mysterious initials of LW. 
The document contained what could either be described as a short poem or a cryptic riddle. But as short as it may be, just seven lines long, it's still too long to recite here in its entirety because it's mind-meltingly nonsensical. Just to give you a brief flavor, the message contains references to flowers reaching too high and withering in the sunlight, how faith is a redeemer, and something about Pussycat going to London to seek out his fame and fortune. You never saw this kind of behavior from a corner of 64. At this point, Ken Webster still suspected that either Debbie or Nicola were just pulling a prank, even if the punchline didn't seem to be particularly funny or worthwhile. This is exactly what's going on. Like, someone just ran into the room and typed it out real quick before they went to the pub. So when they got back, they'd think, oh my god, it's ghosts. It's not too hard to imagine how Nicola could have told the others that she'd left the computer on the boot screen before they departed for the pub and then acted all surprised when they returned home. Perhaps it was just a snippet of the sort of material she was composing for her performance sketches, in which case it's no wonder that we've never heard her name since. But Ken still wasn't too troubled by any of this and had largely forgotten about it by the time he was ready to start tucking into the Christmas turkey. The BBC Micro was returned to the school very shortly afterwards, and not much more was said about it. The other weird activity in Meadow Cottage appeared to die down a little bit after Christmas, although there were still very occasional glimpses of odd footprints and strange noises. But things were taken to the next level when February swung around and Ken was given another opportunity to borrow a BBC Micro from the school. Ken, Debbie and Nicola had again returned home from the cottage the follow following a day out to find a second message waiting for them on the computer screen. The document, okay, it feels like they were talking about the lodger and stuff, but it just sounds like more they're like housemates, right? Because it's not like they're married and they own the house. Oh, wait, do they own the house? Maybe they do own the house, and that's where the person's a lodger. But it just sounds like they're all mates, rather than it just being like one stranger living in the house. Although the third person, I'd, if I was that third person, I'd be like, like a mega third wheel. I live with you guys. We go out together. We go to the pub together. We, you know, prank each other. It'd be a bit weird. The document was labelled R-E-A-T-E, -E, which is interesting as it indicates that the author of the message hadn't entirely gotten their head around how Edward II worked. I couldn't dig up an old manual for the ancient word processor, but I believe that it was possible to create a new document by holding control button down and pressing the letter C. Oh, C, like create? Because I would always press control N for new, right? But in this case, it seems that the person who created the document felt that it was necessary to keep typing the rest of the word create. Could this be the result of an inexperienced human user who is still finding their feet with this borrowed technology? Or, more likely, could it be the result of a slight technical error on the part of the powerful Star Wardens who were engineering this doorway into eternity from a crossroads in time? Yeah, that, that seems much more likely, doesn't it, Danny? If we're to believe that the author of this new message, who again signed off with the initials LW as genuine, then it's not surprising that they may have struggled with the concept of using a BBC micro. By the sounds of it, he was also struggling to deal with the concepts of electricity and light bulbs. The second communication was more direct and straightforward than the first loony poem, but it was composed in an archaic form of English which is difficult to comprehend on the first or even seventeenth read. So in the interest of making a reasonably comprehensible video, of which Simon doesn't appear to just be spouting endless waffle, I'll try and stick to the versions of the text that have been translated into something approaching normal language. Here's a condensed version of the second message which appears to be directed towards Ken. Uh, I'll quote it. I write on behalf of many. What strange words you speak. You are a worthy man who has a fanciful woman, and you dwell in my home with lights which the devil makes. It was a great crime to have stolen my house. This is just, it's just a prank. <laughs> Danny, is this whole script just going to be about prank? It's just not real. It's just not, it's just some people messing with each other. How, how does this stuff really take off and become so popular as like an urban legend or, you know, a story that ghost people think is real? Because it's obviously not. None of this is real. So, we can glean a few bits of information here regarding the author of this rather more insightful and personal communication. For starters, he seems to think that Ken's de girlfriend Debbie is a bit of alright. He's also somehow capable of observing the residents of Meadow Cottage from wherever he is in time, yet he appears baffled by the electric lighting which he can only put down to the work of the devil. And perhaps of most concern, he seems to be under the impression that Ken Webster has stolen Meadow Cottage from him. Ken has now decided that it might be useful to get an outside opinion. He saved the message onto a floppy disk and printed it off at school where he showed it to a guy called Peter Trindle, a fellow teacher with a degree in English from Oxford University. Peter's like, yo, <laughs> what are you doing, Ken? Someone's, how stupid are you, Ken? You always need to go to Oxford, Ken, did you? Because obviously it's a prank, Ken. Peter was more than a little skeptical at first, and suspected that either Ken was trying to wind him up or that Debbie and Nicola had made a good job of winding up Ken. Yes, because that's exactly what's happening. You've got to provide me with something more than just this, Danny. 
But as Peter studied the original old world style version of the second message, he became quite fascinated by the content. Well, not so much with what the message was trying to convey about devil lights and stolen property, but rather in the way it was being expressed. Peter concluded that the dialect, sentence structure, and jargon was a genuine example of Middle English used widely in Cheshire in the 16th century. Such dedicated authenticity would be pretty hard to just quickly whip up when everybody else in the house had nipped to the shops again to buy some more paint. Although Peter still wasn't entirely convinced that it wasn't just a hoax, he became quite interested in the theory that this was a genuine message hurtled through time from, by a local resident from over 400 years ago. Alright, Peter. I guess this one was when you study English at Oxford rather than physics. But if the author did indeed hail from the 16th century, as the language suggested, this did pose a few further questions. <laughs> Importantly, how the f*** would this be possible? Well, I mean, it poses quite a lot of questions, like how was the author able to transmit a message to a BBC Micro 400 years in the future when he seemed to be so baffled by electric lighting? And was everyone in Doddleson just taking too much acid? But let's not forget that Meadow Cottage wasn't even built into the 18th century, so why was the author claiming that Ken had stolen his house? Well, there was only one way of getting answers out of the man. Ken could just try asking him. How would you do that, though? Well, I'll just write a message on the computer and leave it there. And then the prankster's gonna go back in and type another message. They're gonna be like, really? <laughs> Ken's replying to me. How small and smooth is Ken's brain? Well, Ken figured that the idea was surely worth a shot, and so he wrote his own message on the same document on Edward II, and then wandered away for a while to see if anything interesting happened in the interim. And bloweth me down with a feather it worked. Ken had opened up a whole new channel of direct communication with the man from the 16th century, a conversation which would run for a few years. Ken, what are you doing with your life? <laughs> it's not entirely clear if Ken ever switched off the computer at any point, but I suspect he kept it on at all times in case the mysterious powers at work in Doddleson didn't quite stretch to flicking on a BBC micro that had been turned off. I mean, that would be bordering on the unbelievable, wouldn't it? And whilst we know that Ken continued to regularly borrow computers from the school, at least for a little while, I can assume that at some point he must have splashed out and bought his own. The kids of Hayward and High School must eventually have started feeling pissed off that they were always a computer short because Mr. Webster was playing with supernatural forces again. <laughs> Weird thing. I had a teacher at school called Mr. Webster. <laughs> Over the course of the following weeks, Ken engaged in regular correspondence with the man from the past, usually receiving at least one new message on his screen per day, but only when his back was turned. What did he teach? What did this dude teach? <laughs> I was wondering if this Mr. Webster is the same as... Because Mr. Webster was really old when I was at school. Well, not really old, but he was maybe in his late 50s or 60s. Nah, this was in the 80s, and that was in the 2000s. Oh, it could be. Why <laughs> this is the same dude? It's definitely not. You never know. The stranger from the 16th century gradually revealed that it, in his antediluvian language, antediluvian. I'm gonna look that shit up. Look up. Antediluvian. The antediluvian period is the time period chronicled in the Bible between the fall. Oh, okay, so it's just like some time in the past, whatever. That his name was Lucas Wayneman, and he lived in the year 1546 during the reign of King Henry VIII. Lucas claimed that he got a degree from Jesus College in Oxford and then went on to become a farmer, though he wasn't currently a farmer in the best of spirits after losing both his wife and son to the plague. Wait, why would you get a degree from Oxford and then become a farm? Do people do that? That doesn't seem like a thing. That seems like in the past. Like, the aristocracy or whatever would go and get, like, degrees. Not farmers. Lucas initially seemed a little annoyed that Ken, Debbie, and Nicola were trespassing on his farmland and making such drastic alterations to his property. Although Meadow Cottage wasn't destined to be built for another 200 years, Lucas appeared to live in an earlier dwelling on the exact same spot, which was made from red sandstone. Ken was intrigued by this, as during the troubled house renovations, he'd come across evidence of another structure buried under the kitchen floor, which did appear to be composed of red light, red sandstone. I'm like, wow! Who would know about the red sandstone building? Ken's roommates, definitely. Who could also who also have access to the computer and could be typing away in it. The suspicion gradually thawed over time as Lucas became a little chattier with Ken and Debbie, and it could be said that a weird kind of friendship was forming between them. Lodger Nicola appears to have fallen off the radar by 1985, presumably having moved out of Meadow Cottage to find alternative lodgings in which the host didn't keep hogging the computer all the bloody time. There were occasional inconsistencies in some of the earlier messages from Lucas, almost as if the hoaxer was slipping up. When asked about the current age of King Henry VIII, his answer was miles off the true age of the king in 1546. 
1996. And the fact that Lucas gained a degree from Jesus College is particularly impressive, considering that Jesus College wasn't actually built until 1571. When challenged about this, Lucas sniffily responded that he felt as if he was being tested, and so he in turn was testing Ken and Debbie to see if they would pick up on his blatant errors. Yeah, okay, okay. Could this be more blatantly a hoax if we... This, come on now! That could be regarded as a lame defense for getting the age of King Henry VIII wrong, but it's a baffling de defense for the Jesus College era. How would he have known that the college would be built 25 years in the future? Yes, yes, I didn't actually think of that, but obviously it's true and stupid. Perhaps he had a mate on the Oxford City Planning Council, or perhaps he had more insight into the future than he was willing to let on at this stage. It did seem as if Lucas had access to more functionality at his end in 1546 than Ken and Debbie had at their end in 1985. It was still clear that Lucas could somehow observe Ken and Debbie but it was very much a one-way mirror. One afternoon, Ken left a photograph of a Jaguar car lying around the cottage, and Lucas didn't seem mightily impressed. He noted, I have found your picture of the cart, but it is a crude thing, for without the horse, it won't go very far. He also shared his own thoughts on how they were able to communicate with each other. He mused, I think we are a history book that has its front and back pages joined together. We are each a side of it. <laughs> That's a very scientific explanation. Well done. It would later transpire that Lucas had a bit more to reveal on how exactly he had been given the gift of communicating through the corridors of time, as it involved a third presence lurking silently in this time-hopping party line. A presence from the future. In the meantime, all of this appeared to be taking its toll on Debbie. She was now experiencing frequent, vivid dreams in which she had long conversations with Lucas, and she constantly felt as if she was being watched in the house by something that was making eerie tapping sounds and even occasionally pulling her hair. She became... <laughs> of course you'd feel like you're being watched, because the guy's like, I see everything. She became even more freaked out when the messages from Lucas began referring to conversations they'd shared in her dreams in words which meant nothing to Ken, but everything to Debbie. If I was Debbie at this point, I'd be like, hmm, hmm, maybe we should uh, get the house checked for, like, carbon monoxide. Maybe I should go to a psychiatrist, you know. Because, like, when your dreams start talking to you in real life, there's, there's, there's something up. You need to be on, you need to, you need some help. She was now beginning to wonder if she was at the heart of all this, if she had somehow subconsciously brought Lucas Wayman to life. Ken was still scratching his head as he got to the bottom of the puzzle. The only real clue he'd managed to dig up so far, which may or may not be of significance, is that the messages only came through when the BBC Micro had the Edward II ROM chip installed. If the chip was removed, even if it was replaced with the earlier, earlier Edward, Edward I ROM, the BBC Micro just went all shy and wouldn't play ball. The only two theories that he came up with from this are that it was either the Edward II word processor that was specifically haunted rather than the BBC Micro itself, or that whoever was behind all of this hadn't been able to track down a manual for the earlier version of Edward. Ken eventually grew frustrated with his own fruitless speculation and decided that it was time to call in the experts. When your home is haunted by a mysterious invisible entity who has a habit of rearranging your furniture and cat food tins behind your back, well, who are you going to call? That's right, the Society of Physical Research. Don't know what that is. That could the Society of Physical Research could equally be some like cuckoo people who look for ghosts, or it could be like some people who actually look for like sciencey stuff. The London-based non-profit organization which explores psychic or paranormal activity, I guess the first one, <laughs> may not enjoy quite the same funky reputation as the Ghostbusters team, and they certainly didn't arrive armed with proton packs, but they were the best option available to Ken at the time. Unfortunately, the three investigators assigned to the case Dean were very skeptical of the whole thing from the beginning. Really? The Ghostbusting team were skeptical? You're the ghost team. They begrudgingly set up listening posts to capture unusual sounds, investigated the components of the BBC Micro, and sealed up the room in which the computer was kept for long periods to prevent any scope for human tomfoolery. Ken later claims that with such measures in place, new messages were still coming through, but the investigators just didn't seem that interested. They apparently just came to the conclusion that it was some kind of hoax being staged by either Ken, Debbie, or local troublemakers in the village. Yes, because that's what's happening. We only have Ken's word on this, though. It could be the case that the Society of Physical Research has found no unusual activity at all when nobody could get to the computer and they just buggered off home after a few days. That makes sense. It's like the woman, that woman who was like, yeah, 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 no, I can live off light. I don't need to eat. I just live off light. And then they were like, okay, well, go in a room for like two days. And then she's like starving after like a day. It's like, <laughs> let me guess, let me guess. You've been snacking a little bit, haven't you? We don't know for certain because the society never even bothered filing a report on the matter, which seems a little odd. You would never have re received such sloppy service from Dan Aykroyd and his gang. It looks as if Ken and Debbie would have to go it alone for now. 
Bearing in mind that Lucas had struck up an unlikely friendship of sorts with Ken and Debbie, it could only be a matter of time before Ken got around to asking Lucas what all the spooky poltergeist activity was about, and, and maybe even ask him to calm down a bit with all the nonsense as it was upsetting Debbie and the cat. But it turns out that Lucas didn't have anything to do with it. In fact, he complained of similarly annoying activity at his end in 1546, which was upsetting his chickens on the farm. Somebody or something else was the invisible force behind the dusty footprints and the moving of the furniture. It wouldn't be too long before Ken was given a few more clues as to the identity of this third presence in Meadow Cottage. During their early conversations, Lucas appeared to be laboring under the misapprehension that Ken Debbie hailed from even farther in the future than 1985. In one of Ken's later responses to Lucas, Ken uh, just happened to mention the current year for the first time, and this seemed to confuse Lucas, prompting him to send one of his most curious messages of all. He said, You said your time is 1985, but I thought you were from 2109, like your friend who bought the Leans Boist. But what now? What do you mean? I can't be the only one who was wondering how exactly Lucas was writing and sending his own messages over 400 years forward in time. But did he have his own BBC Micro at his end, installed with the Edward II processor, but most definitely not the Edward I version? Or considering the superior functionality at his end, maybe he had a far more futuristic system to work with? A Commodore Amiga, perhaps? Well, it turns out that he was just using a Leem's Boist, so that's little mystery solved, isn't it? But I'm afraid you're out of luck if you're hoping for a definitive explanation of what or how it was used. Lucas revealed that long before he started chatting with Ken and Debbie, he was visited by another person from the future, who gifted him a device which Lucas referred to as the Leem's Boist, roughly translated as light box or box of lights. Although Lucas is vague as to what exactly this is and how he uses it, the light box certainly seems a bit more powerful than your average. BBC Micro Model B. For starters, he claimed that the light box was invisible to most of the visitors to his house, and he doesn't appear to be using a keyboard of any kind. Instead, he gives the impression that he's more like gazing into a magic mirror, which shows him people from the future, such as Ken and Debbie. Lucas talks directly into the light box, which transforms his speech into an Edward II document in 1985. It's remarkably specific, although I'm a little lost as to how he receives and interprets Ken's text responses. And whilst the box of light sounds pretty impressive, it does have a couple of design flaws, Lucas discovered that it completely stops working if it's ever taken outside his home, and his connection to 1985 could be a bit temperamental. The signal came and went depending on who was inside the future Meadow Cottage at the time. Whenever Ken and Debbie were alone, Lucas got a good five bars of reception, but when other people were in the cottage, such as, say, three grumpy investigators from the Society of Physical Research, the signal went a bit dodgy. Funny that, isn't it? Yes. How odd. But let's not get too bogged down with the technical details, such as they are. I'm sure we're far more interested in the identity of this earlier mysterious visitor who gifted the lightbox to Lucas. Would you believe it? That's a bit vague too. The entity apparently hails from the year 2109. Lucas often refers to him as one, which may sound pretty singular, but just to confuse matters, Lucas also gives the impression that it may be a group of people which he collectively refers to as the 2109. Who <laughs> only? We're making. When Lucas first started chatting with Ken and Debbie, he assumed for a while that they were both part of the 2109 and seemed surprised when Ken declared that he knew nothing about them. Could these shadowy characters from well over a hundred years into Ken and Debbie's future be the real diggers of the Meadow Cottage time tunnel? And if so, what were they trying to achieve? Well, there was one way of getting his masters out of the 2109. Ken could just try asking him. Them whatever. How exactly do you do that, though? Well, Ken figured out that surely it'd be worth a shot just to create a new document on Edward II labeled Calling 2109 and then wander away for a little while to see if anything interesting happens in the interim and bloweth me down with a feather it worked. Oh, it did, did it, Daddy? <laughs> Oh my god, he's making this, it's just a story. It's just, it reads like a creepy pasta. By this point, Ken's fellow teacher, Peter Trindle, was back on the scene, having become intrigued by the idea that Meadow Cottage was now not only a portal to 1546, but also a potential portal into 2109. Peter Trindle. <laughs> For an Oxford educated man, you're sure a bit gullible, aren't you? It's one thing deciphering archaic language from the 16th century to gain insight into the past, but what thrilling secrets of the future could be unlocked by deciphering tomorrow's language? from the 2109. The first reply from the 2109 gave a taste of what was to come. The language felt surprisingly contemporary and easy to read, although it was frequently littered with weird spelling mistakes, unless, of course, the spelling of very basic words evolves dramatically over the next century. Which is possible, 
I don't think there'd be big changes, but there'll be little changes. So in a sense, the words were easier to translate than the messages from Lucas Waneman. Well, that makes sense, because 500 years is a lot less of a difference, uh, a lot more of a difference than 100. But the bigger problem it was in deciphering what the hell the 2109 was supposedly waffling on about. Or to put it another way, the biggest problem with the 2109 is that they insisted on spouting absolute bollocks. Here's the first message, in full, with my apologies. Ken, Deb, Peter. We are sorry that we can only give you two choices. One, that you ha that you either have your predicament explained in such non such a non-rhyme way that you may have instant understanding but cause what should not to not be to happen or to try to understand that you three have a purpose that shall in your lifetime change the face of history we 2109 must not affect your thoughts directly but give you some sort of guidance that will allow room for your own destiny all we can say is that we are part of the same god whatever he it is <sighs> That was so hard to read. It's barely comprehensible. I can't believe I got through it with only a couple of stutters. Now, a grammar Nazi would start having convulsions about some of this, not just because the original version of this message contained almost childlike spelling mistakes and errors, but also because of the way the 2109 talks about presenting the trio with two choices. They're actually presenting two options, which in turn presents only one choice to make. Common mistake today, and it seems still a common mistake in 2109. Oh my god, I just realized I didn't know that. It's like, yeah, of course, you have two options and then you make a choice. It's not two choices. Wow. Oh my god, I just realized. I learned something new today, Danny. Thank you. Somewhere in between all this nonsense, we did have something useful. Just to be clear, I'm not a grammar Nazi at all. I firmly believe that you can write or speak whatever way you like, as long as your intended meaning is clearly understood and not open to misinterpretation. This is why I would probably have made a rubbish English teacher. But this is where the messages from the 2109 fall down. They generally read like impenetrable riddles composed by a new age hippie who is trying to make out that he holds the key to enlightenment but is not nearly as clever as he thinks he is. It now sounded as if that very first message that popped up on the BBC Micro, the weird poem about withering flowers and pussycat going to London, was from the end of the 2109 rather than Lucas Wayneman has previously assumed. Here are some of the fried golden nuggets of wisdom that were spat out by the 2109 over the course of the next few years. How can we have a name? We are many, but no more than one in the time to come. We have no retirement. Ah, what an age to be if the digits were reversed. And another. It's better to have no knowledge at all than to have a distorted view of the truth because of your lack of understanding. Or we move at a speed so that we cover every point in your time and universe. We have no form. We feed off a neat energy that you will not have heard of. <laughs> oh my god. It's it. I feel like the problem is like everyone in this house is an adult and this feels just like it's written by a, a weird edgy teenager. The eyes are open yet nothing do you see. The great retarding mass is your convict. Quietly alone he sits in the dark waiting for sentences to be passed. Blah 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 blah. I'm not even gonna read it. This is just not any new a any old new age hippie. It sounds like a new age hippie who's indulged in far too many disco biscuits and is never coming back down again. It also has to be said that in contrast to the friendly tone of the conversation with Lucas Wayneman, the communications from the 2109 were decidedly cold and often bordering on the condescending and even the downright threatening. Oh, one nice touch from the 2109 is that they admitted responsibility for the poltergeist activity in Meadow Cottage and agreed to nip it in the bud on Ken's polite request, although they never made it clear why they were doing it in the first place. Ken also claimed that the 2109 also made a couple of accurate predictions which came true over the next few years, including the validation of Fermat's last theorem, which was proposed in 1637 but not officially solved until 1995. They also provided the coordinates of an undiscovered star, which matched the coordinates of a quasar discovered just a few years later. Wait, did they actually do these things and publish them ahead of time, like make them clear? Or were they just like, yeah, yeah, no, they, the guys predicted that. It's like me being now like, oh, yeah, 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 there's going to be this, there's going to be that. And it's like, well, of course. <laughs> but aside from the poltergeist termination and crystal ball gazing, 2109 were rarely in the mood for a cozy chat and often seemed as if they found all the interruptions from Ken and, Ken and Debbie to be somewhat annoying. One of their later messages read, We, 2109, are not without compassion, but if you continue to disrupt our experiments, then it is likely you who will find your destiny. Dokey dokey, edgy teenager. Although it's hard to decipher much real value from the dozens of messages composed by the 2109, we can just about ascertain that they are from a tachyon universe. Although they point out that our own current understanding of what a tachyon universe might be is wholly incorrect. The 2109 
are now embroiled in some kind of experiment with wider cosmic purpose, which is either beyond the understanding of the current residents of Meadow Cottage or too dangerous for them to hear. So just stop. Just, just why, why are you writing back? <laughs> why are you writing? I'm just going to win you for experiments, future people in your tachyon universe. Stop writing to the people back in 1985. You don't understand. <laughs> Yet they also concede they are not entirely in command of the experiments, but are merely attempting to guide Ken, Debbie, and Lucas Wayneman through it safely and ensure that they don't mess it up with their pesky human inquisitiveness. However, the 2109 may not have been expecting the curveball that was thrown into the mix following the events that unfolded in the 1576 segment of the Meadow Cottage Time Tunnel. If you thought this story was already bad crazy yes i absolutely do danny i think it's creepy pasta crazy then be warned it's about to get as nutty as a moon calf lucas wayneman only went and got himself arrested for witchcraft well that's if lucas wayneman was his real name which it turns out that it wasn't although lucas had previously claimed that his box of lights was invisible to most other people it seems that doesn't apply to everyone when ken and debbie were checking their bbc micro one day for any new messages from lucas or any new wishy-washy drivel from 21 109, they were surprised to see a message from an entirely new person in 1546. His name was John, and he was a good mate of Lucas. But he had some bad news to impart. The local sheriff, Sir Thomas Fowlshurst, had heard rumors of Lucas and his devilish box of lights, and it decided to arrest Lucas on charges of witchcraft and communicating with spirits. John explained the dilemma in detail to Ken and Debbie. Quote, the sheriff does ask that you speak to him in person rather than through the computer, which he can't see. Otherwise, the computer must be taken to Lucas in Borton Prison to show that he spoke the truth. But it is not easy to move the device, and it seemed to disappear when we have tried. Only when Lucas is here does it appear solid. I beg quick reply, so I may go to him. During these exchanges, it was revealed that Lucas had been lying about his name all along. His real name was apparently Thomas Haywarden but that he had been living under a pseudonym to protect his true identity from witch hunters, and he clearly hadn't trusted Ken or Debbie quite enough to ever disclose his birth name. Yeah, the people in the future are really going to be a big problem for that. That didn't dissuade Ken and Debbie from leaping into action to help rescue their friends from the fate of being burned alive. They actually got pretty tough and hardcore with the sheriff, who reluctantly agreed to communicate with them via the box of lights, presumably in the presence of Lucas. Sorry, I mean Thomas, to ensure that Leem's voice doesn't suddenly disappear beer into thin air. Ken and Debbie threatened to use their mystical powers from the future against Sheriff Falhurst if Thomas wasn't released immediately, and this eventually spooked the sheriff enough to have Thomas released within a matter of days. Bravo for Ken and Debbie. What the f*** is going on? Not sure what they could have done if the sheriff had called their bluff, though. Maybe they could have just started sending him cuss words from the 1980s. But now we have another problem to contend with. For some reason, the 2109 was furious that Thomas Haywarden's real name had been revealed. That had not been a part of the plan. In their subsequent lengthy angry rant to Ken, they explained the very loosest sense of the word. We, in your better interests, have made slight adjustments to your conversations. Thomas is a person living in the 16th century, but unknown to him, he is not quite what he seems to be. You must state how much information you have on this man. Everything, word for word. Avoid any communication with him. Desperation, be quick. <laughs> Ken and Debbie were actually getting a bit fed up with the 2109 now, particularly after the 2109 had admitted to editing the conversation taking place between the 1540s and the 1980s, which may have been a failed attempt to stop the revelation of Thomas Haywarden's true identity. Oh no! Fresh out of jail, Thomas was feeling similarly distrustful of the 2109 and proposed a new, more private method of communication with Ken, which might eliminate any risk of outside interference. He suggested that Ken should leave a pen and piece of paper by the side of the computer before he went to bed that night. Sure enough, Ken awoke the next morning to find an elegantly handwritten message had been inscribed on the paper which was signed by Thomas Hayward. And I don't know about you, but all of this is starting to get a bit far-fetched for me by now. <laughs> really, Daddy? <laughs> Is it? Is it starting to sound a bit far-fetched by now, Danny? <laughs> it's, it's, it's 16 pages in, Danny. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Oh. oh, but from Ken's perspective, this new method of conversation seemed to go unseen by the 2109 and proved useful for receiving more confidential messages from Thomas, even if Ken couldn't respond in the same way. It would appear that the box of lights, which was interestingly described as a computer by Thomas' friends John, had even more swishy functions than we first thought. 
that crack in the fabric of time wasn't entirely focused on the BBC Micro after all. The 2109, perhaps sensing that they were losing their grip on the experiment, had a final request to make of Ken, which involved getting outside help from, of all people, a ufologist. The 2109 made the request in a surprisingly direct and straightforward message. We ask you to do the following. There is a brilliant researcher, a ufologist. We know you don't like the word. His name is Gary Rowe. His ideas differ somewhat to yours, but nevertheless, he can help you with a couple of your problems. You may phone him at the number below and invite him to talk with you. When he comes, show him this and ask him what he makes of it. Peter Trindle must do the telephone him, telling that he got this number from a UFO enthusiast. And so it was that the nutty flying saucer spotter, sorry, I mean highly respected ufologist Gary Rowe, was dutifully called into Meadow Cottage to carry out his own deep specialist investigation into the Doddleson's messages. However, he didn't really hit it off with Ken and the others. The problem started when the 2109 instructed Ken to print off his, its new messages, seal them in an envelope, and pass them to Gary without looking at the contents himself. The messages were for the eyes of Gary Rowe only. This naturally irritated Ken quite a bit, and he started hassling Gary about what exactly those secret communications were all about. But Gary was adamant that he wouldn't disclose the contents of the sealed envelope. The 21 So, I'm wondering at this point, whose perspective of this be- is this being told from? Where does this story originate? And if my, my little spidey sense right now tells me that Gary Rowe might be the, the, the person who wrote this story down later in a book, and maybe sold that book for money. Maybe. That's just my speculation right now. Obviously, I don't know that at all, so let's find out where it goes. The 2109 later attempted to defuse the tense situation when they sent this message to Ken. The communication between Gary and the 2109 is not of interest to you. Gary has a better understanding of us than you do. His experience is a most definitely advantage to this. You must not be pushy with Gary. You underestimate his abilities, and that indirectly is an insult to us. If you had opened your eyes a bit wider and read the communications more intensely, you would have had half the advantage that Gary has. Gary Rowe has and will serve his purpose. So did it work? No. Following the last game of Secret Squirrel, Ken lost his temper with Gary. It's fine. It's perhaps understandable why Ken had become frustrated, having been deeply involved with the Doddleson messages since day one, but now getting shut out of the latest development in the mystery that had been haunting him for years. In response, Gary Rowe stormed out of the cottage and would never return, taking the secrets of the sealed 2109 messages with him. Oh, okay. I guess Gary Rowe's already out of the picture, never mind. I guess this three-way conversation taking place across the 1540s, 1980s, and 2109 couldn't last forever, and it was Thomas Haywarden who was the first to leave the party. Although he may have been released from jail by the sheriff, it sounded as if the other residents of Doddleson were very much wary of Thomas and his witchcraft box of tricks. He felt that he was being hounded out of the village and that his farm was at threat of being burned down in the middle of the night. So, Thomas had taken the decision to leave behind the farm Doddleson and his leams boist. He now intended to catch a boat to Bristol with the ultimate aim of getting to Oxford and settling down in the same city at which he would have obtained his degree in Jesus College had it actually been built by then. But he also promised to write a book on his strange experiences and leave it in a place where it may eventually be found by Ken, Debbie and Peter at some point in the future. Well, why not just tell them now? Just be like, I'm going to write this book and leave it there. And then that very same afternoon they could go there and find the book because it's 500 years later. Just tell them. Just, I'm going to write this book and put it there. Done. Easy. Even if it takes your whole life, it doesn't matter. They're in the future. With his very last communication, he wrote, My true fellows and sweet maid, one day you will all sit down at my table for wine and meat by the river in Oxford, where we shall read each other's books and laugh, and we will speak of truth and good men. In your time, my book is old, but I shall not go to my God until it is written. There we will all be truly embraced. My love to you all. I shall await you in Oxford. Thomas Haywarden. The idea of Thomas writing a book seemed to be confirmed by the 2109 in what proved to be their final communication with Ken and Debbie. The style of this final message hark back to the original nonsense poem found on the BBC Micro with references to pussycats and withered flowers, along with stark warnings such as, Knowledge will be your progress, but your kind are coming close to getting their fingers burned indirectly. You may prevent this. Get out your bricks. Get ready to build. Write the book. In one of the more coherent parts of their conclusions of the final message, they wrote, Thomas did eventually write his book and soon died shortly thereafter. He placed it in a secure place. It shouldn't take many years to find it, though he wrote in it in Latin with the help of a friend that he met at Oxford. We will finish now. You have a lot of work to do. There is no need for you to write back as we will have gone. Thanks for your cooperation, 2109. This final communication appears to have been an urgent call for Ken to write his own book, along with a prediction that he will eventually hunt down the book written by Thomas Haywarden and left in a safe place for over 400 years. Any such book written by Thomas Haywarden has still yet to be found. Oh, 
That's shocking. What a, what a surprise. Still, Ken did get round to writing his own book, which went under the name The Vertical Plane and was published in 1989. Who the fuck published that? <laughs> The book recounts the full story of the Doddleson messages from Ken's perspective and proved to be a popular read for thousands of readers, although others dismiss it as a tedious waste of trees, which is almost impossible to comprehend or finish. Yes, I would be one of those people, even though I've never read it. I know that to be true, in my opinion. It actually went out of print for decades to follow, and rare copies often fetched around £500 on eBay. But a second edition with a little bit of additional material was finally published in 2022 and here we have it here we have where money of course enters the equation like it always does after communications had fallen silent over meadow cottage the only other occasion in which ken and debbie stepped back into the limelight was an appearance on the episode of the 1996 bbc tv show called out of this world which delved into the kooky world of the strange and mysterious and staged comically cheap and tacky reconstructions of supposed real life events i say they stepped back into the limelight they decided not to participate in the dramatic reconstructions and instead only chose to appear in interviews which didn't show their faces the reason given was they just wanted to get on with their lives and didn't want their faces forever associated with the doddleson messages and moving on with their lives is exactly what they did ken got a new job and moved to manchester presumably with debbie and we never really heard of them ever again they fell quiet as ghosts it would have been interesting to find out if Ken Webster had ever again dared to switch on a BBC Micro since his Doddleston days, but for now, he's not saying. He's maybe too busy trying to hunt down his copy of Thomas Haywarden's book, which admittedly, if ever found, could open up a whole new can of haunted worms. Sadly, it seems that Thomas hid his book a little too well. Why wouldn't he say where he's hidden it? It was clearly intended for them to find in the future, so just say where you're going to hide it. Oh my god, what? This story doesn't make any sense, does it? <laughs> What a surprise, this plot hole? No. So, whilst we're waiting for the discovery of Thomas A. Warden's book, what else do we have to work with that might explain what was really going on with the Doddleson messages? Well, I'll tell you what. Ken wrote about this in a book that he later sold. So let me tell you what. Let me tell you what I think. I think Ken made f everything up. Maybe it started as a prank. Maybe someone was writing messages on his computer. And then he was like, this is a cool story. Let's just play it out and write it down to sell a book about it. And as I always say, like if you've, got, if you've written a book that's a bit sh and you wanted to sell better, just say, no, this is a work of non-fiction. Bum, done, easy, boom, tickety-boo, sell that book. It's a case which certainly continues to inspire lengthy conjecture in lively social media groups and online forums even nearly 40 years later. Some of the wackier theories include the idea that Ken had indeed tapped into a time portal via the medium of the BBC Micro, but that the Earth had been destroyed in the year 2109. The group of experimenters from the future were operating from a tachyon reality in a bid to change the course of history and prevent Earth's destruction. It's also speculated that Thomas Haywarden, whom the 2109 described as not being what he seems, was not directly communicating from the year 1546, but who instead was either a ghostly spirit wandering restlessly around Meadow Cottage in 1985, or even a member of the 2109 with a different agenda. It might even have been the case that Lucas Wainman and Thomas Haywarden were two entirely different entities, and whilst the 2109 were happy for Ken to chat with Lucas, they had serious objections to any communication with Thomas. Another slightly different theory is that Debbie had become an unwitting medium who was tapping into her dormant telekinesis skills to awaken spirits from the past and future who were mooching about in the astral plane. Yes, I mean, this is definitely possible because all of those things are real. Not, not, they're not real. They're not real. It's just Ken made this up, didn't he? Didn't he? Ken wrote a story. It's quite interesting to note that one of the most frequent contributors to these long-winded online discussions is none other than ufologist Gary Rowe, or at least somebody going under that name. Whilst Ken and Debbie seem to have largely retreated back into the shadows, Gary Rowe, if that is indeed his, if it is indeed the same man, which appears to be widely accepted, is happy to rabbit on until the cows come home. Unfortunately, he never seems to say anything remotely insightful. He keeps banging on about how he alone has those mind-blowing secret sealed messages from the 2109, but he's not allowed to share them with anyone under any circumstances. Sounds like he's just trolling, doesn't it? He kind of comes across as the annoying kid in the playground who wanders around chanting, I know something you don't. <laughs> yeah, he does, doesn't he? Leaving aside the more outlandish theories for now, a more rational mind in search of a more plausible answer might naturally assume that this entire saga was just a hoax perpetrated by Ken Webster or others. <laughs> they would, would they? <laughs> it's a thought which we'll return to in a moment, but could there be any other possible explanation to explore first? 
I couldn't dig up any information about what Debbie did for a living, but it does seem odd that Ken Webster and Peter Trindle were two teachers who would surely have more important and worthwhile things to do with their time than orchestrate a long-running hoax. Unless, of course, it's true that teachers just get far too many holidays. Some of my best friends are teachers, and they just love it when I suggest that. They don't explode with indignant rage at all. I get, I get the feeling that that's sarcasm. Although, like, my sister's a teacher, and so's her husband. And I think they... they they enjoy the the longer holidays <laughs> they don't they're not like oh we're always busy doing this they're just like well, it's quite nice i mean yes they have to do work and stuff over the holidays it's not like they actually get the same amount of time off as the kids but i think the fact that they, they do like the fact that they get quite a lot of time away from the school according to his author's biography ken webster has a rich background in business and economics and has held such titles as the head of innovation for the ellen MacArthur foundation and visiting fellow at cranfield university he doesn't seem like the type to piss about for years on end. And some of the names that popped up in the Doddleson messages aren't necessarily just fictional characters created by a bored economics teacher. They do check out with a little digging into the history books. For example, there was a real Thomas A. Warden who became the vicar in Gloucestershire between 1551 and 1554, though of course that doesn't mean it's the same person who was gifted a box of lights a few years earlier. On a slightly more compelling note, there was a sheriff on duty in Cheshire, in Cheshire from 1529 onward by the name of Thomas Fowlshurst. The name is spelt slightly differently from the Sheriff Fowlhurst, who had Thomas Haywarden arrested for witchcraft, but it's pronounced exactly the same. As for Peter Trindle, he was another highly respected teacher and language expert who put a great deal of effort into analyzing the early messages from 1546 and reckons that it perfectly matched the dialect and spellings of the region at the time. He insists that it would have been impossible to replicate this language so authentically in every single message, particularly as many of the responses came through so quickly. So this leaves us with the only obvious conclusion left on the table. The BBC Model B was haunted. <laughs> ah, yes. The only reasonable explanation why is that? Uh, is uh, ghosts or some shit like that. It's just ghosts. <laughs> it's just an excuse when you don't know. That's not quite as uncommon as you might think. I can remember the computers on display in my local branch of the electronics store. Dixon's often portrayed signs of a mischievous, ghostly presence. There were times when every single computer monitor in that store displayed nothing but the words Dixon's rob dogs <laughs> scrolling endlessly down the screen particularly on saturdays when all the kids were off school draw your own conclusions from that yeah they're just going into start display screensaver and doing the custom text thing <laughs> we're doing it at school <laughs> i remember every time there was like an open day which is when potential people come and come around the school and like look at the and they go around and they're like oh do we want to send our kids here <laughs> We'd go into the library or the computer room or whatever and change all the backgrounds of the screens to pornography. Oh, God. Because <laughs> for some reason, they obviously figured it out later on. But, like, if you were, if you'd logged onto the computer under your school account and changed the backgrounds and logged off again, it would remain the background and someone else would have to log on and change it. It wouldn't just be the generic school backgrounds. Obviously, they fixed this later when they realized they could do, you know, more things with computers. But by that time, we'd just rush around, just running around, changing every background to pornography. And they're just leaving. And because we were children, we found that very funny. <laughs> And I like to think if I was going around a school, if I was going around a school with my kids and I saw that, I would also find that funny as a parent now. I don't think as a teacher I'd find it very funny. <laughs> but as a parent, I'd be like, I did that I did that when I was a kid. That's right, I said it! Perhaps it's more likely that the BBC Micro just happened to be installed with a very early and even version of chat gpt or putting our serious hat on for a moment perhaps it's likelier still that the doddleson messages were somehow being sent remotely from another machine one quite interesting element here is that the edward II chip was manufactured in oh my god where wales can you use some vowels or something cluid c l w i d no vowels in there at all which was a mere 11 miles from doddleson and only about five miles away from the school at which ken and peter worked could there possibly have been any way in which wayward employees of the manufacturers was toying with the resident residents in meadow cottage and could this be why the messaging only worked on edward ii rather than the earlier edward one ship no that's just <laughs> it's just silly whilst there was no way for the primitive bbc micro to hook up with the fledgling World Wide web some retro techie types have speculated the doddleson messages could have somehow been transmitted by early radio freak 
frequency signaling across a short distance from the manufacturing plant oh please i mean yes technically possible i suppose but come on now it's debatable whether this would have been even remotely possible in 1985 and it certainly would never have worked both ways the bbc micro itself would have had to been equipped with some pretty cutting edge technology and we should remember that ken was borrowing different random machines from the school in the early days okay okay fine fine then i guess we have to just accept that it was haunted besides none of this would explain how thomas haywarden managed to communicate with ken by projecting his thoughts onto a piece of paper during their later conversations if it wasn't the manufacturers of the edward ii chip who were playing a prank is there any chance it could have been somebody else outside of meadow cottage in a circle such as a mischievous local breaking in to plant the messages and then move around the furniture this is a pretty popular series it might also explain why the peculiar poltergeist activity didn't exactly involve plates and cups levitating across the room in front of ken and debbie the dusty footprints and and the cat tin formations all took place with no witnesses and there was nothing truly amazing or otherworldly happening here such as blood spurting out of the kitchen walls it was all stuff that could easily be done by humans with a few minutes to spare hugely surprising that isn't it some have pondered why ken and debbie didn't just set up it on camera to monitor the computer and potentially catch a prankster or maybe each other in the act well it's the 1980s <laughs> setting up a hidden camera it's like where are you gonna hide that the cameras were big and super expensive if the messages continued to spill through even when it was proven that nobody touched the computer that could be an indicator that something truly strange was going on in meadow cottage but it's understandable why ken and debbie didn't go right down that route bearing in mind that the earliest camcorders first came on the market in 1983 and they cost an absolute fortune about six thousand dollars in today's money and it's crazy now that even on this old ipad like there's a camera there's a video camera on here that i've never even used never used it and it's that something much than that just 40 years ago it would cost six thousand dollars crazy isn't it uh yeah if they couldn't afford to buy their own computer in the early days they wouldn't have been able to buy a camcorder either i'm of the opinion that the biggest issue with the village pranksters theory is that it's almost as ridiculous as the theory that all the messages from 1546 and 2109 were completely genuine uh well it's not ridiculous as that danny it's ridiculous like i don't believe it at all but it's not as ridiculous as time travel there were over 300 messages received from either thomas haywarden or the 2109 not to mention all the ghostly activity that was going on so this means the pranksters would have had to break in undetected hundreds of times in a relatively short time period for this to work i know that home security wasn't exactly high tech back in 1985 but this is stretching credulity just a little bit unless ken and debbie spent their whole lives walking around in a daze if anyone st is still clinging to the idea that the Dodgson messages must therefore have been genuine there are a few too many suspicious elements for my liking quite aside from the fundamental problem that the whole concept is as mad as a light box of frogs there's the aforementioned issue of lucas wayneman as he was known supposedly testing ken and debbie by pretending that he attended jesus college in oxford when it wouldn't have built for another 25 years while some have questioned how on earth lucas could have known that jesus college would be built in 17, 1571 i suppose he could have learned this from the 2109 it's more puzzling why the name lucas suddenly changed to thomas, changed thomas hayward in later on in the story yes maybe he was hiding under a pseudonym to evade witch hunters but i can't help feeling there was a different reason there was no trace of a real lucas wayneman dating back to the 16th century but there was most certainly a thomas hayward could a potential perpetrator of the hoax have come across the real evidence of thomas Haywood and decided to change the name of the main character to add a little bit of credulity to the story could he have danny seems extremely likely in my opinion it's also quite curious that the new surname matches the name of the nearby village in which both ken and peter taught at Haywarden high school there was even the name of peter's house ah i knew i recognized that name i was trying to think do i recognize it from this video or did i just record a video the other day with some dude who had the same surname no it was the the high school that's right i knew it seemed familiar sheriff falhurst may be another person who really existed but this part of the saga is particularly unconvincing and the sheriff acts in the most peculiar manner surely after having thomas haywarden arrested for looking into a witchcraft light box he himself decides to commit the exact same crime before releasing his prisoner and allowing him to take his sinister box of tricks with him but even sheriff falhurst is not quite as unconvincing as the 2109 themselves there is going to have a bit of difficulty faking language from the far future as you have to try and predict how the language and orthography will have evolved over time the potential perpetrator of this hoax seemed to try and get around this problem by just having the 2109 converse in a fairly modern manner but showing shoving in loads of spelling mistakes to make the text look a bit distinctive yeah but you have to be consistent right and i don't think it's i don't think spelling is the biggest thing that changes it's the introduction of new words 
Like, there's all words there's, uh, and phrases. There's new words and phrases being introduced all the time. And I feel that those would be a much more common thing to come across rather than just, like, change spellings. As for the 2109 themselves, they can't seem to make up their mind about who they are, what they want, and whether or not they're in charge of the experiments. Most of the messages are just insane, meaningless drivel, which is trying far too hard to sound mysterious and clever, but rarely says anything at all. If the 2109 really did come from the future, then sadly the future appears to be full of idiots. Maybe that's not so implausible. The idea of Thomas Hayward in writing a book and leaving it somewhere for Ken Webster to find in the future is quite a clever idea, but it's not an original idea. Fifteen years before the Doddleson messages started coming through, Jack Finney wrote a novel called Time and Again in 1970, which has been described by Stephen King as the greatest time travel novel ever written wow i'd really i i must read that i i like stephen king wrote one of my favorite time travel books 1963 and if he says this is the best one i'm inclined to believe him i will search that out the novel includes a segment in which the narrator explains that he wrote the manuscript after traveling back in time to 1882 and then left it hidden in the new york public library for his friend to find in the future could this have been the stolen idea which inspired one of the final plot twists in the doddleson messages <laughs> If, as seems incredibly likely, the Doddleson messages was all just one big hoax, which of the main characters was behind it? When I first started digging into this story, I had my money on the lodger Nicola Baguli. Yeah, me too. Well, no. First I had my money on the pet cat, but then I changed my mind about with Nicola. After all, she seemed to be a creative soul who enjoyed writing performance sketches, and maybe this was the ultimate performance sketch. However, as she disappears from the story quite early on, I think we have to rule out Nicola. Whilst we're at it, I think we can also rule out Peter Trindle too, as he seemed to be quite skeptical of the whole thing and noted that his own during his own observations, the new messages usually came through when Debbie was in Meadow Cottage. Hmm. <laughs> well, what could that mean? Debbie was also the only one who claimed to see visions of Lucas Wayneman in her dreams and to be to be far more affected by the poltergeist than her boyfriend ken however the most accepted theory is that the hoax was perpetrated by ken webster either with or without assistance from debbie i actually have another final suspect in the frame which i find far more intriguing but let's stick with ken for just a moment i think is danny gonna go back to the ufologist guy the ufologist dude Ken admits in his own book, The Vertical Plane, that he was growing tired of the Doddleson messages and he was keen to move on with his life by the late 1980s. That's possibly an odd thing to say when you believe that you're receiving messages from the past and future. I'm bored of all this potentially earth-shattering stuff that is happening to me. I think I'll take up bowling instead. Whilst he was still at Doddleson, he also left his job at Hayward and High School and took up a new position, which apparently was far more demanding and left him with little spare time. It seems more than a little bit coincidental that during the exact same time period when Ken was allegedly growing bored of all of this, and he found himself with less free time, both Thomas Hayward and the 2109 suddenly decided to seesaw conversation and fall silent forever. It's possible that this was a shrewd marketing plan gone wrong. Ken may have been setting us up for the discovery of Thomas Haywarden's manuscript, which he intended to write himself, but then had a change of heart. Perhaps he realized it'd be quite difficult to write an entire book in the challenging 16th century language of Thomas Haywarden, and it would fail to pass the intense scrutiny of ex were experts who were bound to deem the manuscript to be a fraud. It would be much easier and less risky to just write his own true story book on the matter and forget about the antique manuscript which was destined to never be found despite the confident predictions of the 2109. Yes, yes it does, doesn't it? It sounds like he's following my tried and true formula of if you want to write a book and it's not very good just label it as non-fiction or maybe ken just lost a bit lost a bit of faith following the fairly cool reaction from the press which bordered on complete disinterest although certain quarters of the uk press usually lap up a good ghost story this one didn't seem to generate much interest at all at the time aside from a small article in the daily mail ken's idea of writing his own true story book under his own name may have proven to be his downfall Dr. Laura Wright of Cambridge University is a language expert who disagreed with Peter Trindle's assessment that the Tudor text of the Doddleson messages was authentic. She reckons that the verb structure was hopelessly wrong and concluded if it's supposed to look like early modern English writing, it doesn't even look close. But Dr. Laura Wright also took the time to compare the text of all the Doddleson messages to Ken Webster's own language that was used in his book, The Vertical Plane. And following close analysis of the use of adjectives in front of nouns, she concluded that their styles of writing were remarkably similar. Shocking. <laughs> it sounds as if Ken Webster may have written himself into a corner and that the Doddleson messages and the Vertical Plane were both written by the same hands. You what? <laughs> Here's the one final plot twist that I want to throw into the mix before we reach the final page. What if Ken Webster never existed and the true perpetrator was nutty ufologist Gary Rowe all along? Holy Really? What if Ken Webster never existed? I assumed we had some record of Ken Webster being a real person. 
If we rewind the VHS cassette back to that 1996 UK TV show, Out of This World, there's a fascinating moment which gets overlooked by followers of the Doddleson messages. As I mentioned earlier, we never get to see the faces of either Ken or Debbie during their interview as they're keen to protect their privacy. The narrator also went to great lengths to stress that neither Ken or Debbie wanted to be identified. If that's the case, then could it be that the shadowy Ken and Debbie were actually using pseudonyms? If they were that keen to protect their privacy, it seems a little bit silly to have their real names plastered across the TV screens of Great Britain. There's not really much evidence at all to suggest Ken Webster was a real person, or at least there's not much evidence to suggest that the author of The Vertical Plane was a teacher living in Doddleson named Ken Webster. At some point, somebody gave an interview to the Daily Mail, somebody Somebody wrote a book under the name Ken Webster, and somebody gave a faceless interview on television. It's true that a man who at least sometimes goes by the name Ken Webster has an author's biography and appears to have held some prestigious positions, but it's not out of the question that he and Gary Rowe may be one and the same. Can't you just someone phone up that school and be like, yo, school, did you ever have a teacher by this name? And they'll be like, no. <laughs> Done. Done. Mystery solved. Just go back through their archives. Schools keep a record <laughs> taught at their schools. It's been tricky to dig up any concrete information about the main players in the story, so it can't be ruled out that Gary Rowe just created his own cast of characters in a long-running work of fiction which never happened. In this dimension, at least. The idea that the Society of Physical Research allegedly got involved adds a bit of authenticity to the story, but the fact that they never filled a report suggests that they only got involved in the author's overworked mind. And it's funny how when the 2109 were looking for a ufologist to help make further progress on an experiment that was never actually explained, they selected a guy who just happened to live around the corner in an electoral ward which was reportedly made up of precisely 2,109 households at the time. Was this maybe a cheeky clue? Whilst Ken, Debbie, and the rest of the cast of characters have slipped into obscurity, Gary Rowe is still the only one keeping the flame burning in his regular forum posts, which often sound as nonsensical and as meaningless as the supposed communications of 2109. Perhaps Gary was another mother on another marketing drive to generate fresh interest in the 2022 reprint of The Vertical Plane. Or maybe he even plans to spill the beans one day on those secret communications in a book written under his own name. This could be the latest development in quite a remarkable promotional strategy, which has so far spanned nearly 40 years. I mean, and did sell like thousands of copies of a book. So maybe it worked? Whilst I would conclude that the Doddleson messages was almost certainly a hoax engineered by either the entity known as Ken Webster or the entity known as Gary Rowe, I'd be happy to eat an entire pyramid formation of cat food tins if I'm proved wrong by the discovery of a 16th century book penned by Thomas A. Ward and which is deemed to be authentic. Yeah, me and Danny and I will eat that cat food together. I'll eat an entire tin of cat food. If the, I'll eat the entire pyramid of cat food slowly over time, if that turns out to be the case, because it won't because it's not real but yum <laughs> which one of these two potential books is likely to be the first to land in a bookstore near you my quite remarkable adventures with the leams boist by thomas haywarden or okay then i'll tell you what's inside those sealed envelopes by gary rowe placeth your bets now yes God, this was a lot of nonsense, wasn't it? Thanks so much for being here. If you enjoy the show, please leave it a review. If you're watching on YouTube, like and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.